Hey, it's Nicole. Welcome back to the Entrepreneur Show. So excited to have you and introduce you to another serial entrepreneur, Joe Rare. And that's his given name. How cool is that? He is an underground serial entrepreneur, investor, outsourcing expert. I can't wait to hear more about that. He currently owns four digital companies, five wedding venues, and real estate investment properties too. He's made for this show between Matt and I. And one of the things I can't wait to hear more about is all of his companies are fully run by, you guessed it, virtual assistants. Hey, if you're an entrepreneur who usually fast forwards intros just like this one, this is the podcast for you. Hey, just a reminder, our show is brought to you by Smart Cookie Media, where we believe data tells a story and not just any story, your business story. As a subscriber to the show or as a client, you'll get insights on profitable data-driven marketing strategies that work for you and your business, your industry, not some cookie cutter trends. No ideas that are led by your customer data so you know they'll work for you. Connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram to learn more. Everything's in the show notes. Now, let's get back to the show. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank welcome, you so Joe. much for having me. I appreciate it. How would you finish the sentence? You know you're an entrepreneur when? When you would suffocate if you had to work for someone else. Oh, what a good verb, suffocate. Is there a story there? Is there a time you were no, suffocated? No, because I have been an entrepreneur my entire life. Aside from during college, working jobs, you know, restaurant, things like that, I haven't had jobs because I know for a fact that there's no possible way I could live working within somebody else's dream. Wow, oh, I love that. Where yeah. does that come yeah. from, do you think? My dad was a failed entrepreneur, like hardcore failed, like made the family suffer and yeah. never succeeded. But then on the other side, my mom and my stepdad were both employees. My mom was a waitress. My dad was a police officer. And so I don't know where it came from because it's not like watching failure and watching struggle is motivating. What I saw growing up was like, you know, my mom had her little envelope of like, hey, this is all the money that exists for Christmas is in this little mm -hmm. envelope. But when I was just finishing high school, we took a trip from, we lived in Northern California. We drove to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada to visit my grandparents. And I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad cover to cover three or four times during that trip, just over and over and over. And that just ingrained in me. Then it was all I could do is just try to figure out how other people were doing the things that I wanted to do. One thing that stuck with me as a young kid, I had to have been 12 or so. And there was a guy in town. Basically what happened was he takes me and his son to an Oakland A's baseball game in the middle of the day, a day game. And every other parent is working. Mm -hmm. but he's yep. not working. Yep. He's yeah. taking mm -hmm. us to an Oakland A's game. And it's like, how can he do that? But my parents can't. Yep. Number one, they didn't have the money to do it. But number two, it's the middle of the day. And then as I got a little bit older, you realize like he owns the biggest business in town and right. he had free time at all times. He was at every game. He was a coach. He was this. So seeing all of that, then reading the book when I'm a little bit older, it's like, I want to be him. Right. And I want that. You know, my parents didn't have that. They couldn't do it. I mean, they were there for everything they could be. But they weren't taking the middle of the day off, taking us somewhere. You know, and then I see him and his son, you know, they get to go on vacation. And it's like, we didn't have that. And when I realized that he was an entrepreneur, it's like, that's the answer. Yeah, I love Nicole. that. If kids can see it, they can. Yeah, so I always say if kids can see it, they can be it because that's what sometimes it takes when we're that young to then give us the confidence or the reckless attitude sometimes to like do the things, right? <laughs> like my parents gave me everything they possibly could, which was not a lot, 80s and 90s, not a lot. Love you, mom. Love you, dad, if you're listening. This is not an attack at all. However, I always looked at it like, despite that example, like I'm going to do that in spite of, like other kids rebel different yeah. ways. I was like, yeah. I know you want me to go to college and I'll do that. But at some point it was like, I'm going to prove I can do it better, different. Yeah, some other yeah. way, so. How cool is it show you actually had the rich dad before that? Like you didn't even know. That That's so like, yeah, that's true. Kind of had two poor dads and then one rich dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, so fitting. So tell us, I certainly know there's a lot of them, but tell us a bit about the businesses that you do own. Yeah, so the largest business we have is a virtual assistant services company called Level 9 Virtual. That is, we provide virtual assistant services to small businesses around the world. Our team's primarily based in the Philippines. I've taken a model that we created by launching a marketing agency. It was doing well. And then it wasn't doing well because business development team decided to not develop any new business. We lost two of our biggest clients, which were about 40% of all of our revenue in just two oh. clients. And we lost them within about two weeks. Oh. And then it was taking on debt to pay payroll because we had 27 US employees sitting in a fancy office. So we had super high overhead, even though I was the outsourcing guy, 
I hired my first VA in November of 2008, and mm -hmm. I have had one every day since. And even when I had that agency, we still had 15 VAs on top of all the U.S. employees. I ended up opening a U.S.-based office with a whole bunch of people with glass walls, you know, big old conference room, thinking it would impress somebody. And the only thing that it did is make me broke. And mm -hmm. so I took on a bunch of debt to pay payroll, met a guy who became a mentor and said, look, I don't know what you're doing, but close it down. And at the time, I asked him a very simple question. I said, what are you doing in revenue right now? And he's like, oh, we're doing like 60 grand a month, but we only have two people on our team. And I'm like, yeah, but we're doing way more than that. You know, we're almost triple what you're doing, but my overhead was like 30 times more than his. Right, was. right, right, right. And so I couldn't fathom because I'm an idiot sometimes and I couldn't fathom shutting something down with that much revenue, listening to a guy who's doing less, but not correlating his profit was so much more. So I didn't listen to him. And of course, months later, I see an interview with him and the interview is, hey, what are you doing in revenue now? And he says 400,000 a month. And I was like, What? And mm -hmm. so I text him and I just said, what did you do? And mm -hmm. all he said back was, you didn't listen to me, did you? Mm -hmm. So within a couple of days after that, I fired everybody, shut down the office, stopped paying my rent, got yeah. sued, went to battle on that, found a way to pay off the judgment. And I went back to the very basics. And that's, I launched a business in the wedding industry, which is an agency serving wedding venues. And so that was the agency model. And we went from one client paying us 2,300 bucks to in four months, we were doing 109,000 a month. And oh. when I relaunched, I had over a quarter of a million dollars in debt because I was paying everybody's payroll. Now all I had was VAs, no office space. I'm working from home. And so within a couple months, boom, no debt. And then I said, hold on, if I can do it with that business, why don't I just do that with Level 9 Virtual? And so then we scaled that and that just went nuts. And so that's two of them. And that's kind of how I got rolling. So agency done for you services yep. for wedding venues. And then once yep. you figured out that niche, you're like, wait a minute, we can go broader. We can go bigger. Yeah. And so, and so then it, became, it. it became actually creating a model that I could replicate in any business, which is how we ended up growing and adding more companies. Yeah. It's because yeah. the model is identical. Yeah. Wow. Let me ask you a question, marketer to marketer. Don't yeah. you find that one of the things about marketing is there has to be a done for you component? Like there's no. like, it's really, you don't feel that? Not anymore. In the agency for the wedding venues right now, we're making a massive shift where we're going from done for you with software, which is, hey, we have this great software component. The whole system runs through this, but it's our strategy and our implementation that makes that thing operate. And we've been doing that for years. It's been very successful. However, done for you service sucks. Client yeah. services sucks. This is my opinion. So yeah. if you run client services, yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize. No, it's, no, no. It, it's it's I do. It's like you have client success managers that you have to retain clients. The retention rate, churn is super low in software. Super low. Yeah. Like 3x below services. So sure. I've been thinking this entire time, how in the world can we get out of full service? Well, software with education. And so I call it Sway. S-W-E. I created everything that we've ever done into a training program. And then all we do is we deliver the training program. We use the software on the back end to keep people sticky. And once they adopt the software, they know exactly how to use it. We can implement and put everything into it for them. And then they can press go and run it. And now we've gotten to the point where we can actually execute that. So now full service, we don't offer it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And okay. so we've got our existing clients. Maybe someday we'll tell them no more. But for now, anybody who comes in new has to follow our Sway model. Okay. Okay. And that's across even outside of the wedding niche as well. Yeah, I so ask this we, because I find that like people by and large view a marketing agency as the way that they have for a million years, mm -hmm. right? And then Mad Men cemented that for everybody. That's right. Because I think what they crave, and I don't think the client usually would use this word, but I think what they crave is the right answer, which means they want leadership. Show me the way, show me to get to the right answer, make sure I'm doing it right. Don't make marketing my life. That's not really my thing, but I know I need it. And so they're just like, I need leadership. And what that usually looks like is moving a lever for them is what by and large, what they've all been trained with marketing agencies. We did it to them, right? Like we trained them this way. Yeah. And I think there are some brave enough to take on education or learn it. I'm seeing a lot of people that are burnt out too, though, by learning it. They sure. do just want someone to be like, let me just right do here. it for you. Sure. Yeah. And I think yeah, yeah. I would come backwards and say, it kind of depends on what you want in your life. So yeah. my biggest claim to fame is that I don't operate my companies. I have virtual assistants. I build teams that operate all of the companies that we have. 
Yeah. My model is to build something around my lifestyle, not carve out a lifestyle out of a business. Because what happens is, is somebody starts a business and they had these grand ideas of freedom, whether it's financial freedom, whether it's time freedom, whether it's I just want to be able to do my own thing whenever I want to do it and kind of have this laissez-faire like type lifestyle. The reality is very, very few people ever achieve it. The Oakland A's guy. They end up married to their clients, <laughs> yeah, right? And they're right, married right. to their business. I was just at a convention a week ago and I'm listening to some of these guys and like, they're talking about the grind. And I'm like, dude, you guys realize like the snow's about to fall. All I do is snowmobile all winter. I don't work. So like you guys are all gearing up to have this fantastic Black Friday thing. And I'm like, we don't even do Black Friday deals because I'm not there. I'm not even going to create anything because I'm not working. Having client services is very demanding. Mm -hmm. And without the proper team, which costs money, it's labor costs, it's time costs, it requires somebody to maintain these clients. And it's not going to be me. We sell the hours of labor to fulfill services as them. 60% of our client base is agencies. And our virtual assistants do all the fulfillment as the agency for the agency's clients. I hate to go back to the story no. originally, but with the Rich Dad Poor Dad, when I read that book the first time, I loved that my mentor was a very young age, 19 years old, had me read it. But the book really changed my life. And I went back and read it after I read Cash Flow Quadrant. And I know we don't tend to get really big into books and talk to other people's books on the show. But the reason why I think it's critical for us to discuss that is that what Joe is identifying is there are too many people who claim to be a business owner, an entrepreneur, run their business, own their business, but they're still in the S quadrant. They're still self-employed because they are owned by their clients. They don't ever get to the true, what we'll call B quadrant, the business owner, where you just own the business, manage the business, but you're not really at the demands of the business. You're not being run by your clients. It's almost a fundamental value or principle that you have to stick to as you're building. And that's why you've been able to achieve the results you have because you built this level of a company from past experiences where you've learned your lessons. So now yeah. you go, I am building this company with the intention. It is not going to be ran by me. I'm not involved. I don't answer the demands of clients. Otherwise, I'm pulling myself right back into the S quadrant and it defeats the purpose. Yeah. So I'll take it even a step further because this is where people really don't understand even the quadrants, right? The ESBI. Right. right. People forget the I. Can you give us a quick rundown on those four real quick? Yeah. So employee, self-employed, right? You run right. a little small business, but you actually operate it. Business, which is big business. Typically, they define that as something doing $100 million a year. However, I consider myself in the I quadrant. Because I'm nothing more than a strategic advisor and an investor in my companies. So my right. model is my team comes to me monthly, quarterly, wherever we need. We create a strategic plan. I choose what resources we're willing to allocate, financial, labor, et cetera. And we choose what resources are going to be deployed in order to execute those plans. But I don't do the execution. I step back. The plan needs to go get executed by the people who operate the companies. My point is, as though... By and large, the clients that come to them want marketing leadership, want the right yes. answer, want the gold star and the revenue. And so many times they get scared of pushing the button themselves. So you are answering that by still providing a done for them solution. But they're doing that still knowing, OK, but somebody is leading this virtual agent. And I think that's what's really important here is if marketers are listening right now, if agency owners are listening, not only get yourself into the right quadrant, yes, but also consider that a lot of the client base that we're helping or that even have been burned before. Oh my gosh, how many times do I get to talk to someone yeah, who's been burned? There's, there's the story. I'm always yeah. like, you know what? You should work with someone else first before we work together. Like go find one more before we work together because so many are just trained that you're going to do it for me, right? You're going to move the button for me. No, I believe that you can do it. There's some education. It's just a hard pivot for some clients is, that they're like, I really need someone else to do it for me. I don't trust myself with tech or this or that. And you're answering that by saying, in my business, I want this. And so in order to have that, I need someone else to push the levers. And I think that's what's really powerful, that if a marketer, marketing team, agency owner is listening, is your clients are still going to show up and they're going to want that. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're looking at different client bases, right? So right. my new client base is not somebody who's looking for done for you. Yeah, right. What they're looking for is an answer to a problem. And we will support them and get them to that point. But after that, all we're doing is collecting the reoccurring revenue right. over the software and the education of those pieces. And right. if they need support, of course, we have a support staff that's available to make sure that right. they're pushing the right buttons right. and the levers and all those things. However, what we're not going to do is actually physically do it for them. And it's because we've built everything into one platform 
so that we don't have to be doers. The platform Mm -hmm. gives them the power. Look, you're using our strategy. You're using our ad campaigns. You're using our copywriting, all of those things in one platform so that you can go execute and do it yourself. And you're going to save yourself tons of money. And then if you need support, you can ask us questions. And so then we do group coaching calls and that's run by our team. I need to like dig into something else. I'm having a very aha moment right now. And that is you consider yourself in the I quadrant of your own companies in which there were companies where you were the S or the B in must be a hard thing to go through or just commit to and stick to it. Because once you know how to do it better than them, once you know how to operate the company and you're like, you know what, do I really want to spend the you know, six figures on a COO for my company, right? Um, I think it depends on what you value most. If you look at anything that exists of me as far as a profile goes, family above all is the thing that I care about most. The one thing that my kids know is that this is my home office. If I'm in the middle of a podcast, my kids have the right to walk in here, stand right here, wave in the camera, and that's that. And nobody's going to tell me otherwise. And my kids know that they have complete freedom to come to dad for anything at any time, no matter what. There is very few situations where I will choose a business situation over my kids, over my wife, over those things. So for me, the freedom, hands down, is the most valuable thing in the world. Now, what does it take? It takes financial resources in order to have freedom. End of story. In my opinion, you can't really gain one without the other. However, if you value freedom in true freedom, I mean, like do whatever you want, whenever you want without limits, the only way to get there is to remove yourself from your business. It's just so hard to imagine yeah, being that person that knows how to do it all and has done it all and just say, you know what? We have people who run those jobs now. Your reason why you're doing it to stay committed has to be so much more important than anything else. And yours is family. You know, the idea of saying no, and people talk about how powerful it is not to say yes to everything. Right. That's got to be one of the hardest things to do is when somebody's offering you money, for example, full service, they'll pay me five times more money than we're going to collect if we just do it for them. The ability to say no is so hard. However, as soon as you can exercise that muscle and get decent at it, and then you actually see what it provides on the back end. So for example, when we say no full service and we move into just this, you know, software with education model, we see speed to close as far as sales go. Why? Cost is way lower. People are willing to adopt it. We give them enough support to make it successful for them, but we can close more deals faster. And then if you reverse back and you look and it's like, okay, we took that one deal and let's call it a $5,000 deal. We just closed 10 over here. So we're making more money than that deal so far. And reoccurring revenue starts before they even launch. So your two big clients that you had, there were 40% of the business. What vertical, what industry, what were they in? One of them was a construction company. They built commercial buildings. And then the other was an orthodontist office. Okay. okay. But the problem was back then we did everything for everyone. We didn't have a niche. Yeah. How did you choose weddings? So interesting enough, one of my best friends at the time had a wedding venue. It took me four years to convince him to let me run a marketing campaign that I had in my head. What is he it with friends? To me. And he goes, oh yeah, no, no, we're referrals only. Like, it's great, it's great, it's great. Finally, he says, yes, let's do it. Well, we double the business in 14 months and he's crushing it. But everything else in my life, as far as the business goes, is falling apart. We're losing money, I'm taking on debt, all those things. After I messaged my buddy and said, hey, what'd you do to get to 400 grand a month? And he messaged back, you didn't listen to me, did you? And then we go through that whole thing. I'm like, I don't know where to go from here. He says, look, just pick one niche and do one thing for one niche and be the best at it. And I'm like, but who? And he goes, well, look at your client roster. And if every one of them called you on a Sunday when you're sitting with your kids, who would you pick up the phone for? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, Whoa. he happened to be a friend. But the only reason as far as a business standpoint, I would answer the phone is because I knew he's not calling me for a fire. He's going to call me for something better. He goes, that's your niche. Just do that in that niche. And we did. Four months later, we're doing over 100 grand a month. It was the easiest move in my career. Awesome. Awesome. Hey there, busy movers and shakers. I get it. You're out there conquering the business world, hustling day in, day out. Well, guess what? We've got something to amplify your efforts, something that's about to make your entrepreneurial journey even more exciting. Introducing our podcast production services, your ticket to sharing your knowledge and stories without breaking a sweat. We know your time is gold. That's why 
our team of podcast pros will take the reins, handle all of the behind the scenes stuff. From brainstorming fun topics, introducing you to incredible guests, polishing up those episodes, repurposing your content so you can share among lots of platforms. We're here to turn your ideas into a podcast that's as easygoing as your favorite chat over coffee. Imagine establishing your expertise and your authority, making connections all across the globe in just minutes a month. And the fun doesn't end there. Our data savvy approach gives you insights that will help you fine tune your content and connect with your audience even better than before. So join forces with a crew that's as enthusiastic about your podcast as you are about your business, the Smart Cookie Media crew. Let your voice resonate, your stories inspire, and your ideas spread like wildfire. Level up your personal brand through the magic of podcasting, whether you choose audio only or video too. Are you ready to dive into podcasting? Your journey to share your knowledge starts right here because it's your voice, your podcast with our expertise. Smart Cookie Media, turning your stories into conversations. So you do support entrepreneurs who repeatedly take new ideas and turn them into successful strategies. Would you give us what they need to hear right now? I would say keep trying new things. Don't be afraid to fail, which obviously if you're an entrepreneur and you're building something and you've created success at any level, the chances that it was like your first one and you hit a home run is pretty damn slim, right? That doesn't happen very often. So I believe just continue to fail. And then if you're building a team with systems, allow your team to fail. Now put stop gaps, right? Like don't be stupid and let somebody go bury your business or like demolish your client base. But give people freedom to go try something new, expand on their skill set, allow them to come up with ideas and improve operations and realize like, I'm not going to fire you for it. The idea of failing is not celebrated enough. I know that's a weird way to put it, but the failures ultimately create the successes. There's always chaos before breakthrough. So you also own venues. Yeah. You have some real estate as well. So you got into this niche and then what? The quick version is my buddy who owned the venue you know, after we doubled the sales in the venue and the bookings and so forth, I just went to him and said, Hey, you know, it's time I made you a couple million bucks. You need to like pay me more money. And <laughs> the quick conclusion was yes, like obviously, but we actually want to give you some equity to make you a partner so that the decisions you make moving forward are from a place of like you're personally tied to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then it was, Hey, there's an opportunity with this venue. We could do a turnaround. All they need is this, this, and this. So let's step in. Let's take some equity in exchange for providing this service. And so we did that. And we've done that 14 times. We've sold out of nine and we still have five. So when I was 19 years old in my Mark V Econ class, I brought up this idea of performance and equity and ownership. And do you right. know that a lovely professor adjunct, this wasn't her full time, worked for one of the largest marketing firms in the world, Leo Burnett. So I figured wow. she would know, like this would yeah. be like, if I tell, talk to her and be like, if you could have had a piece of McDonald's, like, do you think Leo Burnett would have done that? Like, what do you think? Do you know that I was wildly discouraged? Nope, don't do that. Make sure you get paid. Just get your deliverables out there and get paid. You can't trust it. You can't this. You can't that. I think because of the burn rate on it, most partnerships that come into those situations get obliterated. Yeah. I think that yeah. the back end performance, it's so hard to create transparency in those yep. situations. Who's going to open up their books? Right. Very right. few. Yes. Right. Who's going to let you see payment processing? So you actually know there's so many bits and pieces and the partnership has to make sense. It has to be right. Yeah. Where we had leverage was that when we walk into one of these situations, if I turn off the marketing and the processes that we created, their business goes back to the shit right. that it was. Yeah. We had right. all the leverage. We protected strategies, assets, ad accounts, everything. They didn't actually get access to it. So we had to be, you guys have to be transparent and we shut it off and you're screwed. Mm -hmm. And that was where we knew going in and we had leverage, we could create opportunity for ourselves. In a separate thing, I've seen lots of people do like, for example, hey, we're going to run all this marketing. We're going to pay for it ourselves. We're going to do all this. And then when you get a sale, you're going to give us a percentage. Yeah. Good luck with that. Good luck with so the tracking. Good luck with transparency. You're just not going to get it. But Joe, where really I'm getting a little confused with it is, isn't there some more hands-on work to be performed when you're you know, at the early stages, the system wasn't designed with the software did it all, correct? So you're coming yeah. these equity positions, you're still actually happening more, we'll call it consulting or advice yep. or whatever. 
because there is more involvement from you where the system is not yet performing and all the gears are turning and you're just plugging and playing into the next venue, right? Yeah, then, we had the system dialed in pretty darn well to okay. where, again, it's run by VAs. So <laughs> you look at cost leverage as right. an example, you know, set up, build outs, operations. I'm not physically running ads for somebody. I have a VA doing it. Right. right. So what would be U.S. operations are here and, you know, outsourcing operations are down here. This margin is pure profit mm -hmm. plus the upside in right. the equity. Right. And so you kept all ad accounts. Yep. And then all payment processing also went through that system no, as well. We still ran their same payment processing, but we were very, yeah. very clear that we don't do it unless we had transparency. And so yeah. we were super clear about books. We mm -hmm, actually right. entered into legal entity, you know, partnerships. These were sure. literal. Yes, actual. absolutely. Of so, course. I mean, we did it the right way where, mm -hmm. hey, your LLC is a partner with our LLC in this yep. other LLC. And so mm -hmm. no matter what, we all got to be responsible here. So we're going to open yeah. it up. And most people, I believe, don't go into a lot of these deals like that. Yeah. And we see it, especially in the marketing space. Performance based this. Good luck. That's going to be mm -hmm, a tough one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, how many appointments? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yes, right, 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 right. right. Where did that yeah. deal come yeah. from? Can you prove it? Mm -hmm, right. But mm -hmm. if I'm in the actual registered documentation for a company, that's different than where everybody else usually comes from, where they're getting paid for performance yeah. and things like that. Yeah. The interesting thing they did by doing that, and it's good for them and smart for them to recognize this, whether they knew they were doing it or not, is they're also ensuring that they're getting those fiduciary obligations, you as an owner, and protecting you from their competition too. Because now oh, all of a sudden, yes. I don't take the guy who's amazing at doing this and let him get shopped to all my competition yeah. in the same marketplace. He's doing it for me, and he has that vested interest to ensure yep. that we are performing at a high level because of that. So fantastic. And the fact you docked it, I'm like, man, this guy should write the book on doing this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, looking for it. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, what is it? it? Yeah. When's the book That's come great. out, Joe? Good yeah, stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Only if Chat GPT can write it. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask real quick, the, the VAs and the way the system is designed, is it only in agency-based stuff? Is it only in like whether it's venues, campgrounds, or you roll out the model to other service-based clients. Anybody can run the model. It doesn't matter what type of business you have, as long as there's areas of your business that don't require physical presence. Sure. Right? So anything that requires physical presence, obviously that's not possible, but typically for operations of most companies, you don't really need human beings sitting in an office space right in your local town. You just don't need it. And so we've put this into chiropractic offices and dental offices mm -hmm. and construction companies. It very much works in any service-based style business. Okay. okay. What is one of the key lessons you learned as an entrepreneur? Maybe it's a mantra you find yourself saying again and again. Fail fast because I can go attempt something faster without fear of failing than most people will even start their very first thing. Everybody else is still trying to build their landing page or get their logo right or, you know, register their email address. They haven't done anything. And we've already been four and five iterations down the road. Love it. Love it. How would you define your entrepreneurial success? From day one, the only reason to be an entrepreneur was to create freedom. Freedom comes in many forms for many people. But for me, what it is, is every month we take our kids to Yellowstone National Park and they get to see things that most people will never see in their entire lives. We get to homeschool our kids and they go to a farm school, you know, a few days a week. We get to take them snowmobiling and hiking and all these things. We can do it literally every single day if we choose. That is why I became an entrepreneur. So the middle of the day, Oakland A's game. I like that's it. That's right. The middle, <laughs> of the, day, the middle of the day, Oakland A's game. That's right. Full circle. Yeah. I love that. So Joe, tell us what is the number one link if someone wants to connect with you to learn more about you, maybe somewhere that they can reach you fastest. Level nine, number nine, virtual.com. Joe at level nine, virtual.com is the best. Thank, Joe, thank you. Joe. Thanks so much. Hey, it's Nicole. And that's the end of the interview, but stick around. This is the part where Matt and I break it all down and give you our favorite takeaways. Listen in. Hey, Matt, we just got done talking with Joe Rare. My goodness, what a rare breath of fresh air. What was one of the big takeaways for you? I'd love to explore that one and chat it out. When the guy gave him the advice, say, who would you pick up the phone for in a Sunday afternoon right now? Number one client, who would you do that for? I was like, man, that's powerful. That's really powerful to figure that out and make it that simplistic, you know? Do you have that person? You don't have to name them here, but do you have that person? Did someone come to mind? There's someone coming to mind. 
No, no, not really. Really, <laughs> honestly, I mean, they're all like, eh. am I practicing law? Probably. I don't know. I don't even know. That's a whole bigger question. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I do struggle with the day, like Sunday to me. One of my business rules, I say your business, your rules all the time. One of mine is Sundays are mine, right? Like there are plenty of times I'm thinking about the business, but that I've trained my brain. So for him to say that day was kind of like a trigger, like they might be calling with a fire and who would I answer for? But I will tell you another activity that I went through a while back. Thanks to Mike Michalowicz. Love that guy. Love all of his books. And one of them inside, I think they do it in two books potentially, is his pumpkin plan book. But then I think they call it inside the run like clockwork book or clockwork, crush and cringe. Who of all your client roster are you crushing on? I'm paraphrasing. Please go get the book. But who are you crushing on? Like, who can you just not get enough of? Who do you love supporting? And then who makes you cringe? And I've done that exercise. I've done it a couple of years ago. So that's why sometimes in this interview, when it was like, well, would it be hard to pull yourself out? Or would it be hard? And I, I always just say, you know, choose your hard. It's not hard for me when I realize who I need to break up with as a client, right? Like right. I can be pretty ruthless about that. And it's those that, you know, aren't coachable or aren't willing to do the thing or make some changes or do call me on a Sunday, frankly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know. frankly, that's not my favorite. So to me, it's fine who that crush is that you pick up the phone because he even said he's not going to call me with a fire. Like he's calling me because he's got something good. And yeah, key. I instantly yeah. thought of somebody right away. Like, yep, totally take that call. Well, I think that that was a great takeaway. Is there anything else you want to share? You know, anytime we have these conversations with marketers or marketing agencies, or at least somebody that skews that way, even if they've changed their model, you and I always have a side conversation about smart cookie media. So Mm -hmm. There's something you want to dive into. Well, the thing I was thinking about was how he controlled the faucet in those relationships. I mean, he said, basically, it was really easy in our joint ventures and these legal relationships we created where we actually got equity in the company. And that was very simple. And that is, fine, you want us to stop performing what we're doing. You're going to make no money. We make no money, right? And it made me think about how you run your agency with certain types of clients, like rather than being... And I'm going to call it as gently as I can, this amazing mercenary, like sniper for hire that can target ads to people and find money in people's back pocketbook that they don't think they have and get them to open up their wallets for your clients. Like, is there a different, broader approach to, and I know he won't call this, but essentially done for you, whether it's with VAs and services and softwares that I know you use in your company and invite clients to use, like, is there a way you could scale more of smart cookie by implementing this strategy of, and I mean, he said he would even do payment processing for some clients. I'm like, you know, I'd just be doing it for all the clients. That way I know for a fact the numbers, you know what I mean? Is there a way that would work for you? Right, right. So I have thought about this a lot as I gave the example when I was 19, it was how can marketers get paid for performance, not in a 100% guarantee and not even 50-50 partnership. When I say partnership, I mean a partner of a business. Right. And I grew up watching my uncle create Oak Partners, which they're all partners in this wealth advisory firm. And I can't say that that influenced it, but you know, maybe somewhere through osmosis as a kid watching that happen, it does make me realize I could probably help a whole lot more people. If I could do these ninja marketing tactics to a whole lot more because we weren't just doing it so high touch, so one-on-one, because I think what we can do deeper for some, if we were to come in as equity partner, could be powerful for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Matt. You know what we say, folks, if you're listening. Keep listening. You've been listening to The Serial Entrepreneur Show, produced by the team here at Smart Cookie Media. 